<laughs> Maybe. Oh, there's not that many. Crikey, we might go to bed early tonight. <laughs> Let's see what the content is, okay. <laughs> oh, this is three in one. <laughs> Sending meta to myself yesterday. The gentle upwelling in the chest suddenly transformed into a gigantic rushing waterfall that split my chest open and got bigger and bigger. My body drifted off into space. It was intense but beautiful and overwhelming. As I turned my palms up to release some of the energy, it subsided into a huge tranquil Pool, pool. I almost read poof, <laughs> but I think it was a pool. I have questions. <laughs> what happened? Well, I think what happened is that the gentle upwelling in the chest suddenly transformed into a <laughs> <laughs> rushing waterfall that split your chest open. And <laughs> Yeah, overactive imagination, no. This sounds just like a result of the meta practice. You know, you can suddenly have these heart openings. A lot of the time they're sort of gentle and just a softening, but sometimes they can come all at once. It's like uh, one of the stories my teacher tells. He says there's like, um, it's a bit of a sexist or whatever, <laughs> so I'll try and change it a bit. <laughs> But there was uh, someone who was new to the country of Australia and uh, who had to get a very manual job and they weren't used to the kind of way things worked in Australia. Let's say it was a female builder. So she went out every day and went to the building site and then she'd come home in the evening and the husband said, so, darling, how much did you make today? <laughs> and then she said, oh, nothing, nothing. They didn't pay me anything. And he said, oh... Oh, I'll go to work again tomorrow, dear, and then we'll see what happens. So she went back the next day. Mm. Not sure about this country, they don't pay you. Uh, worked really hard, sweated, toiled, almost dropped a brick on her foot. And then again, they didn't pay her, and she went home to the hobby, and the hobby said, So, darling, did they pay you today? And she said, No, they didn't pay me. And he said, Well, you know, you might as well keep going back to work. I mean, you're the only breadwinner. So I just keep going back. So she went back the next day. And then she came home again, still didn't get paid. So by now she's a bit fed up, but she thought, well, I might as well just keep going. And then guess what? On the Friday, before she left work, they gave her a big paycheck. And then she came back home to the husband and she said, you wouldn't believe it, I got this big paycheck and I've worked out how things work. From now on, I'm only going to work on a Friday. <laughs> Great, I can tell recycled jokes and you've not heard them before. <laughs> so this is the thing, you know, like you might get little payoffs all the time or you might think nothing's happening in the meta, but because of all the momentum that you built up at one point, it just becomes quite intense and quite beautiful. So I think, uh, yeah, it, just enjoy these things when they come. I mean, it'll probably never happen again like that, quite the same, but it's nice that you've used the language of water here, like a waterfall, giant gushing, gigantic rushing waterfall, and then this pool, this huge tranquil pool. It could be that you, you know, it said it was, you said it was intense, beautiful, and overwhelming. I mean, it is a kind of uh, samadhi nimitta, in a sense, because their characteristic is that they're intense and beautiful. They're also very stable, so it seems that it did start to um, become more stable, like this tranquil pool. But also, when we um, react, either with overwhelm or by, here you lifted your palms, which is fine, because you're not used to so much energy, and this is what we do when we're not used to them, you know, we kind of move a little bit, and then it does subside. Um, and it probably disappeared after some time. But when we get used to being able to hold that energy and stay still with it, then it will release and subside and become stiller and more tranquil anyway. And then the mind may be still enough to take it even deeper. Or let's say the mind's not taking it deeper, but you're not preventing it from going deeper. 
So, um, but it's beautiful and it's lovely and um, very nice. So, not an imagination. Is this embodied as my body seemed to go away? That's fine. Eventually the body goes away. Um, that's what I was talking about, about how the energy starts to go into the mind. I mean, it's words, isn't it? So, but I think this is what I mean. <laughs> this is one way that it can happen. Here you say that you um, kind of, your body sort of drifted off. It's just perceptions. I mean, it's not really that your body drifted off anywhere, but it's perceptions. It's the way the mind sort of interprets these things. So, yeah, sometimes it seems to be like floating. Sometimes it seems to be very diffuse. Sometimes it can become like huge, you know, in your mind's eye, the body is like huge. Sometimes what happens to me is it's like it's falling. And um, these are the times that it's kind of just about to disappear. And we do interrupt, and you, you turn on the body sense again by raising your palms, turning up your palms, so it wasn't completely gone. But when the body completely goes, that's the time that the nimittas usually get stronger, because it's just a reflection of the mind getting strong. It's just the way you start to see the mind. You see it as a light, or you see it as a peace, or bliss, or something like this. So um, you were embodied up till then, and then you got yourself re-embodied, <laughs> which is fine. Should I have kept going? I don't know, because we have to go through these phases. I went to Ajahn Brown once, and I told him about something that had happened, and you know how it became very intense, and then I kind of stuffed it up, because I knew I shouldn't, but I was like, ooh, <laughs> it's subverbal. There's a kind of you know, getting involved again, it's like, he calls it sticky fingers, and it feels like that. It feels like, you know, you're kind of there watching, and you're almost about to go, but you don't really want to, because you want to know what's going to happen. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he'd say, oh, you know, you've blown it. And he didn't at all. He just said, oh, it's part of the course. It's just part of the course, and so you get used to these energies. So um, what happened, happened. It had to happen that way. So, yeah. But next time, just, um, it won't happen like that again. But the more you get your trust in the process, and this is why it's helpful sometimes to talk about, you know, the stage of everything tranquilizing and the senses kind of becoming subdued and the body becoming very, very subtle. It's good to talk about these things because then you'll know that this is a natural part of the process. And gradually you'll get more confidence to let the process unfold. Hmm. That's nice though. Why does samadhi make my tinnitus go ballistic? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's because the mind is getting very strong, you know? The mind is getting kind of like a huge magnifying glass with superpower mindfulness and everything it experiences seems very uh, intense in a way. So I'm not sure if your tinnitus is actually going ballistic, or whether it's just, again, the perception that notices it more and more, and it could be the case that um, you're focusing on it a lot. I mean, some people actually practice what Ajahn Sumedho just started teaching as the sound of silence, which is his own practice. It's nowhere in the text. Um, but there is a kind of sound, and I mean, once you sort of start to hear it, like a sort of high-pitched sound in the silence... Um, you can't really ignore it anymore and actually it's a bit of a shame because <laughs> it can be disturbing but the point being that you know, if something comes to our attention the stronger the mind gets the more it tends to hone in so um, I mean I can't speak from experience because I don't have actual tinnitus but I have had that sort of ringing thing and I guess I just try and keep it on the edge of the mind like don't bring it in to the centre don't kind of hone in on it, but just let it be there and try to, in a sense, turn to something else without pushing it away, but just, you know, it's there on the periphery, just like when you watch a TV screen, you're not looking at the controls nearby, you know, you're not looking at the edges or the shape, you're just kind of focused in. So um, I guess that might be why, and obviously you're noticing it more because there's not a lot else going on. <laughs> You know, so yeah. But it's probably a good sign in terms of the practice that the mind's getting more empowered. 
We'll be done in 10 minutes. No, not really. You mentioned that the Bhikkhuni Sangha died out in the Theravada tradition. When and how did that happen? And I guess the real facts are that nobody really knows. Um, I'm not a historian on the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Um, one of the Bhikkhunis in California, Ayatata Loka, she's quite a historian. She's looked into these things a lot. I don't know how accurate all her research is, but it's certainly quite prolific. And she might have some clearer ideas about this. They say it's about a thousand years ago. It could also be due to some kind of famine or something like that. The interesting thing that a lot of people don't know is that um, the Bhikkhu Sangha apparently died out in Sri Lanka for a while because of some floods or something like this. Because obviously if we live on arms, people have got to be at least able to provide for themselves before they provide for monastics. In a sense, it's, I mean, even very, very poor countries, actually. Some of the poorest in the world, like Myanmar, which has spends less than 1% on education and health combined. It's the worst in the world for that. I saw it ranked in number 90. Of, I didn't know there were 90 countries, is that right? Apparently there are, anyway. And it was number 90 in terms of um, health care. And yet they really do feed the monastics with the best food they can. But it's meagre and it's difficult to, to be there, especially as a Westerner brought up on, you know, more nourishing food. So I think that this is one reason that these sanghas sometimes die out. Um, and most probably, if there's a choice between feeding the monks and feeding the nuns, <laughs> I guess, that might be why, and maybe there were never as many, I don't really know. Um, it's really hard to say, but there is some kind of archaeological evidence, apparently, that there, were, there was a bhikkhuni sangha in Myanmar until around a thousand years ago, which is amazing. Which there should have been, I mean, it's such a strong Buddhist country, I mean, I can't imagine there wouldn't have been. And they have drawings as well on the, some of the temples in Bagan, one of the beautiful pilgrimage sites. It's like just got hundreds of ancient Buddhist temples. It's magical. And there's some uh, drawings in there, paintings of bhikkhunis. Um, so I don't know. I don't even know if it's really true. Because it's hard to believe there wasn't someone practicing somewhere, to be honest. But I guess it does... It has always seemed to require the bhikkhu sangha. And that's an interesting one because still today we take our ordination from bhikkhunis, but we get confirmation from the bhikkhu sangha, which means they also kind of accept the ordination. We do a ceremony with them as well. And I like it. I mean, why not? Right? It's nice to feel the full support of the sangha. But some bhikkhunis are saying we don't have to do that, actually, because, I mean, we're ordained by the bhikkhunis. We are already ordained by the bhikkhuni, um, but we just get it doubly done. And there's one nun in, um, or bhikkhuni, or female monk, she likes to say. In, um, well, actually, she's in Italy now, m most of the time. And she was ordained on one side just by the bhikkhu sangha, which is also... You know, some bikinis might say, well, that's not okay. But I really think the Buddha just wanted to make it easy. I think you could do it either way. But that's another story, I suppose. So I guess that's the limit of my knowledge, really. I don't really know. And I do know that, you know, it didn't die out everywhere. And this idea of Theravada and Mahayana, it's just... It's not in the Buddha's teachings. It's traditions that develop later. But the actual Vinaya that bikinis follow has always been um, kept alive in Mahayana countries in the Dhammaguptaka tradition. It's basically, they follow the same Vinaya. So if they come to our monasteries, it doesn't matter if they're grey robes or red robes or what robes, because we follow the same precepts. So we're actually a community. Yeah. I experience. <laughs> Sorry, it's just funny. And then you clarify. <laughs> I experienced a magical moment when your microphone went dead this morning. <laughs> 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 
not because it prompted you to wrap up the talk, <laughs> but because the sound system sometimes se somehow separates you from us. Oh, it's just for volume. <laughs> I don't want to be separate. Suddenly, I was in your living room having a conversation with a good friend. Oh, it's all been magical, but that was something extra special. Isn't that nice? Well, hopefully you will come to our living room, which will be called Adana Sala, and have a conversation with your good friend sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, actually. It's kind of weird being on a different platform, and then I have this light thing and this thing, and yeah... Ajahn Brown once gave a talk and he said, yeah, I'm giving a talk and there's like three microphones in front of me. And he said, beautiful. I just have the perception, beautiful. I'm just changing his perception. Because it's kind of weird, right? Of course it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have to make sure everyone can hear. That's nice though. It's a shame I didn't have a magic. I had a magical moment. My mind just went boom. As I was in full flow with a very important point. It's so weird because I could almost see, like, I could follow the chain of thought and I could see it kind of falter and, and then kind of go like a fuse, like a fuse just kind of. It's so weird. And then it's just gone. I've tried to think of it since and there's no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> I don't know, is that how you start getting dementia? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> having it in full public view, aren't I? <laughs> oh dear. I started to feel the mind wanting to want as I go about my day. That's really interesting. And of course, it always comes up with something very, very important. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You're starting to see the wanting to crave. Ha! Ooh, you're getting close to Mara. <laughs> do you have any advice for what to do with this feeling of wanting to want? Or the mind scrambling to come up with something in day-to-day -day outside of meditation? I just think it's fascinating to watch. You know, because you're actually getting beneath the motivation of wanting to the actual wanting to want. People think that they're craving for an object, but actually they're craving for the sake of craving because craving gives you a feeling that you're alive. It's called one of the root cravings. The three main cravings are not like for chocolate or for sex or anything <laughs> like that. The three root cravings are the craving to be, bhavatanha, the craving to... Um, not to be, vibhava tanha. And yeah, okay, the craving for sensuality is one of them, kama tanha. But the craving to be is the most interesting because that, in a sense, is why we're here. You know, the Buddha's basically saying that it's the mind that's wanting that creates what it wants. And I mean, you can kind of see that, right? You want to be with a person and then you, you, you make the effort to be with them or you phone them and then you're planning to meet them and then there they are. <laughs> You've created that situation. So, um, yeah, I think it's wonderful that you're starting to see this because this is kind of at the root of existence, really. And um, we're, we get scared because when we don't want anything, like contentment's quite challenging, isn't it? Because when you don't want something, you think that, oh, there's nothing for me to do now. There's no reason for me to <laughs> exist. In a sense. I mean, actually, contentment's very beautiful and it's a lovely um, place to be. But uh, the more content you are, the more, in a way, you disappear. And then you become even more content. So there's a trade-off somehow, <laughs> which is uh, how the process deepens. So I think just noticing this, you might not be able to notice this in everyday life. It might be more the objects of the desire that are coming up, but the objects aren't the problem. Even this word attachment, I think, is somehow misleading because upadana literally means up-taking. Adana is like the opposite of giving. Dana is giving, adana is taking. Upa, up, means up, up, adana. So it means taking something up. So it's like there's a fuel in us and it wants to like find something to burn, in a way. Like it wants to take something up. And the opposite of, I like this also because then the opposite of attachment, if we define it instead as taking up, is then putting down. 
not detachment. Because detachment is, it just doesn't sound right to me. It sounds kind of dangerously cold or aloof or unfeeling and kind of final as well. Like I'm now detached from this kind of person that I used to love, but now I'm detached because it sounds a bit, I don't know. I mean, there might be some beautiful way to define it too, but I like the idea of picking up and putting down because it's more momentary in a way. We have the opportunity to pick something up, but we can also put it down. And if you put something down for a while, it doesn't mean you can't pick it up again later. Um, anyway, that's sort of a bit off track, I suppose. But uh, wanting to want, yeah, amazing. And looking at the mind scrambling to come up with something. I mean, just seeing its patterns and noticing how it creates discontent. You know, and then getting familiar with the mind when it is not like that. Because again, I think it's more um, motivating to see the positive aspect of um, the other side, the positive side of these things, rather than kind of get put off the negative. So get more familiar with contentment, and after a while you'll just see that bubbling up, and then it will be just like, you'll just turn the other way, you'll just kind of ignore it, and it will just subside. It's a bit like that time I spoke about when the mind was very quiet and if a thought did want to come, I could kind of see the energy of it trying to come, but it, because I saw the energy of it and just didn't feed it, it just never really verbalised itself. It never turned into words. So maybe that would be a way. But yeah, it's interesting because we always want the advice, but I'm not sure that giving advice is always a good idea because the process is already happening quite well. So, yeah, just keep watching. You mentioned your extended retreat where you practiced centered on impermanence, arising, passing. What was your method of practice? So I've done a lot of long retreats. The one that I did in Australia, the really long one, was not um, so much centred around that. But I've done a lot of long retreats with going Goenkaji up to 45 days and maybe a couple of months in my monastery as well. And actually many months, but yeah, two months in total solitude. Um, so what was the practice? The practice was basically what Goenkaji teaches so it's kind of like a body scan first you start with breath meditation so if you're doing two months then you do a much longer period of breath meditation for maybe like 15 days or something like that or longer I think maybe well maybe longer than that you can even do it for half the time it doesn't really matter about a third of the time maybe 20 days but it doesn't really matter just to get the mind to some level of stillness and then, um, I mean, by then I was already so into that practice that I didn't have to try to feel the arising passing. Everything would just dissolve. So, but the way you would begin was to start by um, doing a body scan. So like we've done here with the kindful awareness, you'd scan the body, noticing the change in the sensation. So you feel the sensations, but you see the changing nature of them. And after a while, when the mind becomes stronger, you see them changing really fast. And so the whole body starts to kind of vibrate in a way with this sensation of arising and passing. And after some time, you start to notice the passing. And the passing is just passing, 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 like sandbanks kind of falling. That's how it feels. It's like everything's just constantly dissolving and you can barely kind of keep up with the speed so um, this was the kind of arising and passing I was experiencing and um, it was kind of around the clock but as I say you know it was harder to notice the mind arising and passing which it obviously is because each thing it notices is kind of one distinct moment but there's still this sense of someone watching <laughs> and I just realized that it wasn't quite going deep enough it's almost as though with any practice, if you're just only doing that practice for years and years and years, I think perception can get kind of stuck with only seeing things one way. And the insights that come up aren't as fresh anymore. They kind of get to a plateau, at least in my case. But I've spoken to a lot of other Vipassana meditators who are quite senior, even some teachers. And they say the same. They say they get to this plateau 
and they don't really know how to go deeper. And at that time, I started to get in contact with Ajahn Brahm's teachings that he gives to the monks, not the sort of <laughs> silly, like, <laughs> no disrespect to Ajahn, but he gives sometimes just kind of jokey talks, like very light, very light to the um, lay people. It's kind of like sitting with the grandfather around the fire. It's really sweet, but, you know, after a while you've heard all the, all the stories and... <laughs> But these were like really deep talks that he gives to the monastics and they're very powerful and I just kind of sensed that I had to, that this was my next step to kind of find a different approach to uh, samadhi practice because my anapana had started to be so combined with the vipassana that I couldn't even notice the breath, I just noticed everything dissolving. And, um, well, I just realised my mind needed a vest. Achim Mahabhura helped me to figure that out too because uh, I was reading some of his books and he said that when you're involved in insight practice it can be quite tiring for the mind because you're just going in and in and in and in and, you know, you're seeing all this impermanence and suffering and, and it can be quite tiring and that's what I found. And he said you need a place to rest and that place is like deep meditation jhanas. And I realised I'd have to almost like backtrack in a way to kind of get out of that way of perceiving. Is this too technical? No. no, no, no. Um, <laughs> to get out of that way of perceiving, which will become kind of fixed, because it, I guess everything becomes a habit, even though it's a wholesome perception. But it, I think malleability means you can shift perception when you need to. And I realised I was really so conditioned in that practice that it was hard to shift. So it took me two years or so to actually feel a breath, just a breath, and to get this idea of breath as a concept rather than breath as its actual nature, which is that there is no breath really, it's just phenomena arising and passing, it's just particles or whatever, to actually see a breath as a breath. And Ujagara, my other teacher, who I'm teaching with next year, I wanted to mention that. I'm teaching a month-long in Forest Refuge, if anyone's interested in a month-long retreat. Um, he's invited me to teach with him, assist, really, because he's a really, really, very deeply practised person and wonderful, wonderful Kalyanamitta of mine. And um, he told me, he made this distinction between the breath as a concept and the breath as kind of... I mean, they use the word ultimate reality, which comes from the Abhidhamma, but it's more the breath in terms of its characteristic of change. And it's the breath as a concept, just a breath as a breath, which I'm sure most people here have been doing and do do, um, that can help to build the samadhi. So it took me a long time to kind of go back and uh, build that wing of the practice. So now I focus a lot on, um, well, I emphasize a lot of uh, samatha practice and metta practice because I know that the insight will probably come quite easily, but as a result of deeper samadhi, maybe it will go deeper. That's my um, sort of... I don't know why I'm telling you so much about my practice. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so that's kind of what my practice was. And we did do some metta, um, but someone said in, in the discussion today, you know, they were also used to only doing it at the end, you know, you just do it a little bit at the end of a sit, or at the end of a day, or at the end of a retreat. But, yeah, I realised, when you take the robes and you're doing this for life, you want to go a bit deeper in every aspect, really. You've got time, ideally. So now I do more meta practice. Yeah. Can you please talk about how to deal with hopelessness on the path? Any suggestions on how to keep the mind bright and motivated for spiritual practice when feeling burdened by responsibilities and the demands of a regular life? Thank you. Well, this happens to me. I don't have so much hopelessness in terms of, I kind of know I'm on the path, but it can seem really difficult when we are so bogged down with duties and responsibilities and yeah sometimes I feel hopeless in terms of will I actually ever have the chance for like long deep retreat you know 
But uh, I think one of the things that can be really helpful in a busy daily life is to listen to talks, like to get on YouTube or whatever. There's tons of stuff there. This is what I do anyway. I listen to one of my teacher's favourite talks, my favourite talks of my teacher's. Um, and I meditate with that because it's something to, in a sense, engage the mind, but it's also very meditative and it directs me back to why I love the practice and what, I, what it's all about. You know, if somebody can explain that in a talk and you can meditate listening to that, it can really help to um, rekindle the motivation. And there are lots of guided meditations online as well, which is really helpful because then you don't feel that you have another job to do. You know, you can just sit there and just let the guided meditation go, go on. You don't even have to follow it, you can just listen. <laughs> You can just pretend to follow it. <laughs> and then what actually happens is you find you're following it. <laughs> so you let someone else do the work. And that can really help. And I think it's also important to be realistic that we cannot keep the mind as bright as it is on retreat. It's just not possible. And I think a lot of people struggle with this and it's really disappointing and depressing even when people come off retreat and they see all that kind of clarity starting to get concealed and you think, oh, I'm going backwards, it was worth nothing. But it's not worth nothing because it's like every step you take is a step further. There's no backward steps because you wouldn't have done that at all if you hadn't come on retreat. You would have been where you were anyway. So now your mind is getting familiar with how to become bright but it won't always be bright. So I think it's realistic to um, accept that. And I would say to work on other factors of the path, you know, really try to make the other factors alive for yourself so you can have right livelihood and you can get joy out of right livelihood instead of thinking, oh, this is my job, I have to do it, it's because of the money. No, you've chosen a good career because you're a good person, you want to do your best to contribute. So, you know, you probably wouldn't even want to, sometimes people think they want to quit or retire, but actually that you want to contribute. And see if you can just get a bit more balance, of course, but also bring some joy into your mind, and that helps with the balance. <clears throat> and um, I guess another thing would be to try and have some meditation friends that you can sit with from time to time, if not in person, at least online. There are groups online, which I've mentioned, we have groups. We actually have really boring sessions on a Tuesday and Thursday where you just log on and you see all these other really boring people just sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even say hello, they don't, I don't even smile. They just sit together and then the, it gets turned off after 45 minutes. <laughs> helps them keep the regularity. Yeah. I mean, granted, most of these people <laughs> have been on retreat with um, me and Ajahn Brahm, online retreats where we do a session like that. We do a silent session, so then they want to continue because they get to know each other. But they don't really get to know each other. They just see each other's faces. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, you could draw it, I suppose. You could draw a picture. <laughs> but it's nice when you know it's real people that are trying like you. So this is really helpful. Take the support that you can get around you. Otherwise it feels like it's such a task and it's such a burden on you. And um, yeah, the motivation. I mean, the other thing is to read a bit in the suttas because it really is lovely once you get around into it. And uh, the reason I put the quotes there is because now you have had them explained and you've had them contextualized in lots of these talks. So when you read them, you might have a little bit more of a connection with those particular um, quotes or suttas from the texts, and that can be a way in to um, starting to take the Buddha as your teacher because he's the best. <laughs> yeah. And I guess one more thing about motivation is waking up in the morning, it just brings to mind the Dalai Lama what he says. He has a beautiful quote, you can probably find it online. Something like, um, I have this precious human life, and then he makes an aspiration for the day, like, may I use this for the well-being and welfare of all beings?
emotions and but it's really beautifully written something like a precious human life you can start the day with something like that or you can start the day with loving kindness and just you know even bring up in your mind some potential difficulties that you might have to encounter and kind of prepare yourself so it's like okay I've got to meet this person at work I don't really want to do it oh but you know let me just have a bit of loving kindness towards them and then you know maybe it'll go smoothly and just send them some loving kindness so try to make it really relevant to your life and um, then you'll get more inspired and when you next come on retreat you'll see the difference because you've been practicing in your daily life but yeah keep coming on retreats once a year at least <coughs> okay <coughs> okay <coughs> <clears throat> I apologise, you don't have to because it's very entertaining. Mm -hmm. I apologise for the hot dog stand question <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> it was disingenuous to say, what if I were not trying to be funny? I was trying, <laughs> <laughs> albeit unsuccessfully, to be funny. <laughs> On a serious note, I've been surprised by the psychological hit. I have to change my tone now. On a serious note, <laughs> I'm not sure it's really serious yet, I've been surprised by the psychological healing I experienced on retreat. My mother was severely depressed when I was age nine, and I was made of, aware of it back then. I had viewed this as an unfair burden placed on me. During retreat, I revisited this event and imagined my mother... Sorry, I'm getting tired and my mouth's going funny. And imagined my mother wrapped in a thick brown wool blanket. Oh. I was also wrapped in such a comforting blanket. And then yesterday I imagined that at age nine, I shouldered some of her burden and we journeyed out of her depression together. Oh. Is there a name for this type of self-therapy in Buddhism? Am I perhaps indulging in it too much? Thanks for your overflowing kindness and patience. Yes, I'm capable of behaving. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're really sweet. I think that's really beautiful, and this is what I mean about um, letting the practice be creative and intuitive. And I mean, this is what we want. This is the healing power of loving kindness. It's just beautiful, it's personal. It's intuitive, it's relevant to something that you wanted to heal and that came up at the right time to be healed because in a way the mind's very wise and I do think things come up when we're ready for them on the whole, on the whole. And um, it's just beautiful. What can I say? I hope that it's healing for you long term and maybe something you can return to as an image. I mean, it's a kind of compassion as well, but metta, compassion, the comfort, I mean, it's capturing all of those qualities, the warmth, the protection, the being in it together, and also a lot of empathy that you wouldn't have been able to have at that age. I mean, at that age, we need to be made to feel that we're safe, you know, we're, we're children, we will actually die if we're not cared for safely and securely and consistently, right? So it's very threatening, and I'm sure your nervous system must have been very activated. And um, it's far too much for you to be able to carry. But now you'll be able to go back to that with your adult self and the empathy and the compassion that you now have and see your mother in a different light. Because we see our mothers when we're age nine as like kind of invincible and really old and adults and all of this stuff. And then when you become like, my age or younger you realise, or older you realise you're still not an adult actually <laughs> like who is an adult really, what does it mean I mean, our parents would have been probably in their 20s or 30s when we were 9 you know, maybe 40s still children so they didn't really know what to do and if she was depressed, I mean yeah she couldn't help that so that's really beautiful and I think, you know, I do kind of think this has healing power even for your mother, 
That might sound strange because she might have gone on to another birth, but I don't know. I think it shifts something in the energetic connection we have with people. So I'm really, really full of medita for that. Well done. That's so cute, the broken mug, it's got hearts on it. <laughs> Makes me want to drink a cup of tea. <laughs> you remember the story about the broken mug, right? That you can stick it back together with gold, and then the place where it broke becomes the strongest part. The scars are actually the strong parts. <laughs> I got lucky and was assigned the best mug during this retreat. <laughs> wow. Maybe that is the mug. <laughs> a bright red one with the heart embossed all over and a heart-shaped handle. <gasps> Although I've treated it kindly, yesterday it slipped from my hand, hit the floor and the handle, heart-shaped, broke off in one piece. I'm planning on asking if I could buy it as a souvenir. I planned on asking if I could buy it as a souvenir, but now it's worthless. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> During meditation last night, all I could think about was which crazy glue would be best to mend my cock. <laughs> I was also thinking, what would the Buddha say? Gratitude. Hmm. I'm not going to try and imagine what the Buddha might say, but I'm sure that that can be glued back. <laughs> and even without the handle, it's not worthless, is it? Can't you hold it like this? You just have to hold it a little bit more carefully, like you know, like that story about the difficult person, where you have to get down onto the into the puddle, and you have to cop your hands. You can do that with the mug. I think maybe you should take care of the mug and see if you can take it home. I don't know. Um, otherwise, you could put the gold stuff. <laughs> yes. Like the Japanese. What, what's the name of somebody here? Kitsugi. Sorry? Kitsugi. 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 Kintsugi. Excellent. Yeah, what would the Buddha say? I suppose let it go, but you already did, so... <laughs> i.e. attachment, impermanence, desire, shit, you've made me say it, shit happens even with well-intended, even with well in, good intentions, yeah, well-intended loving-kindness, but it's not worthless, and can you mend, hang on a minute, my poor little brain now, okay, <laughs> attachment, impermanence, desire, Shit happens even with well-intended loving-kindness, but it's not worthless, and you can mend, and you can mend. Okay, you can mend. That's right, and we can always mend. And, you know, it makes us appreciate things more when they're still not broken, right? Because everything's fragile. So if we can really see how fragile we are, as well as mogs, as well as everything in, in life, we can really appreciate it more while we have it. Without attachment, we have to keep in mind that it can break at any time. But that means you care more. That means you can care more for it. And then when it goes, you knew it would. But at least you know you cared, right? Because some people are scared to love. And, well, I, I sometimes get scared of how attached I am to my teacher. But I know that I really value having him now. And what I'll aspire to do is take in and get inspired by those qualities so I can keep them going forward. That's the only way, really, to repay that gratitude. So, ooh, technical. The Satipatthana Sutta ends with, if one practices this way, they will be enlightened, for sure, within seven years, months, weeks, or days. Yes. Good. I'd like to think that this is more than just a motivational quote tagged along at the end of an already fine sutta. Yes. What is the significance of this statement? Are these two different questions? Yes, good. Because the significance of this statement is that if one practices this way, that's the significance of the statement. And the bit that people don't 
notice is that it says Vinaya loke abhijja do manasam. And that actually means one practices the Satipatthana Sutta having restrained the five hindrances. Abhijja is a synonym for craving or sense desire and domanasa is a synonym for ill will. And in the suttas, Ajahn Brahmali has done research on this and whenever the first two of the hindrances are mentioned using different synonyms, it implies the whole group. Just as when the Buddha says monks, it implies bhikkhunis as well, actually, I, I believe, because he would address the seniors in the group. So here it basically means having restrained. Vinaya means like Vinaya. Vinaya is like the mm, gerund or passport, something, form of that verb anyway. I'm not very good with grammar. Vinaya loke abhijja dominasam, it means having restrained. Um, basically craving I mean it's translated as covetousness and grief for the world and this is just such a bad translation done by someone who wasn't really a practitioner probably or just had very archaic kind of English and translations really stick and unless people research what they really mean and Bhikkhu Bodhi's got footnotes on that now too to say it means the five hindrances but it sticks and then we get confused we're like covetous how can you be covetous for the world? Or, you know, but it means the world of the five senses. It means sensuality, right? Like craving an aversion for the realm of the five senses. Because that's a loka. It's karma loka. The realm of the senses. So this is the thing. And this is what I realized after years. It sort of came upon me when I was in Myanmar. It was one of the reasons I was attracted to Ajahn Brown because he said the same thing which I'd already realized. That oh, hang on a minute, because I've been meditating for very many years by then, like intensively, at least 16 years. And I mean, you know, a lot of retreats, 10 retreats at least a year and serving at least the same and long retreats and, you know, being a monastic and all. And it's like, okay, so, but I'm not enlightened. And then I realized that's what it means, having restrained those hindrances. So, and then when you see the Satipatthana Sutta as part of the gradual training, Basically, Sama Sati is uh, the seventh factor of the path, isn't it? Seventh. And that's defined as the four Satipatthanas. So that only comes after virtue, contentment, wakefulness, uh, simplicity, Sati Sampajanya, which is mindfulness and understanding the purpose of what you're doing. It's not Satipatthana yet. And then restraining the hindrances. And in many... Um, Texts like one of the ones I put up on the board, Majima 51, first you go into jhanas, so you completely overcome the hindrances, you abandon the hindrances, and then only that you've practiced Satipatthana. So then I started realizing there's a kind of a pre and a post jhana Satipatthana, and there's a big difference between the two. And when you look at the suttas as a whole, again and again and again, it says that samadhi is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. So it's because we don't have enough samadhi, it's because the hindrances are still too active that the satipatthana doesn't go, the practice doesn't go as deeply as it should. And yeah, I guess if it would go as deeply as it should, then indeed you would be enlightened that quickly. <laughs> so that's my understanding of that statement. And number two, if this is so neat writing, if one is able to still the mind and be fully mindful, as you may have been able to do during your Myanmar times, for the above period, one should be enlightened, no? Yes, so I guess I answered it. Um, a lot of the time, it didn't seem like the hindrances were active. But... I still think that the deeper the samadhi, the deeper the wisdom goes, and this is why I shifted my practice, because every... The thing is for me, and I know we're not supposed to talk about the levels of attainment of our teachers and stuff, but monastics can tell other monastics. So some people I do, or I did kind of guess it, <laughs> and then I kind of got it confirmed. And basically, the teachers that I know that have gone much deeper have all practiced jhanas. 
I'm not saying there aren't stream winners who haven't, but I haven't met any that I have confidence in as stream winners. So I felt for me that was the missing bit. And I'm still working on it. So it is rare, but it's rare because it's extremely profound. I mean, you can have incredible teachers, incredible monastics who are still not enlightened, but they're already having so many incredible qualities and lay people too, right? And there are lay people too that I know at least one that I have suspicion is a stream winner. And um, it's possible, but it's not a small thing. And I think it's become very diluted because sometimes it seems that for Westerners, maybe because we're so gold oriented that if we feel it's too high for us it makes us demotivated I don't feel that way personally I feel like if it's really worth doing then it should be profound and if it's not then it can't be the real thing I don't know I can't quite put it into words but I always get more inspired when I think there's further to go does that make any sense and in the teachers and friends that I have met that I have enormous confidence in, there's a really big difference. They're coming from a different paradigm. It's not only... There's just a really big difference. You don't see it at first necessarily because they behave like anyone else. And they even can make themselves very adaptable to behave just like you, to relate to you. But then you realise they're not seeing you as a fixed thing and they're not judging you or measuring you at all and it's incredibly freeing really incredibly freeing because other people all have perceptions of us somehow but you know one of my teachers if I ask them like you know what about last year don't you think I was kind of I'm doing better this year right and he's like oh I just really don't judge he really can't say because there really is no measurement and and I don't know, it's hard to put into words, but there's a different paradigm and they're able to do things with such a sense of freedom and really establish amazing Dhamma centers and monasteries and things like this. And um, the benefit and the numbers of people around such beings are just enormous. So it's really a huge thing that we're doing and it doesn't devalue every step. It makes every step very profound, actually, because we're all, you know on the way, I think. So yeah, I'm kind of glad it's rare because if I thought every Tom, Dick and Harry or Jennifer and Jen and I don't know who was enlightened, I'd get a bit depressed. (laughs) (laughs) Would the Buddha say hardships are directly equal with the bad karma collected over multiple lifetimes? No. Because if that was the case, there'd be no way out. And the salt simile, the salt crystal sutta, I really recommend you reading it because it really changes our understanding of karma. He's basically saying, but I might get the words wrong, but I think the concept is something like that if whatever deed you planted would manifest in exactly the same way that it was planted, then there'd be no living of the holy life because you'd have to experience the effects of every single thing you've ever done (laughs) and there'd be really no way out (laughs) right but it it isn't like that because we can change our mind we can expand our mind we can make it mahagata as i keep saying and there's other suttas as well on loving kindness that say when we have loving kindness that spreads in all directions no limiting comma remains there at that time the results of the bad stuff just simply can't come up because there's too much beauty and strength and vastness in the mind. They just can't come up. So even if they come up, they'll be just almost unnoticeable. And that's if they come up. And the other thing that makes it possible to be liberated is that um, this is from teachers who I have confidence in as areas, as in stream winners and above. But they say that the reason... um, stream winning stops you from kind of going to a lower realm is because you understand that that karma is actually not yours. I'm not sure I can really say this properly in a way that does it justice, but um, 
it's like there's no more guilt because you realise that whatever you've done was produced by causes and there's no more guilt for that. So you don't send yourself to those realms. You don't have that kind of feeling that you need to be punished anymore. So it's very interesting. It's like you can transcend your karma in that sense. I mean, there might still be things that come and bite you, like apparently the Venerable Mahamogalana, who was the left-hand monk of the Buddha, like left-hand senior most disciple, with all these psychic powers. He was um, apparently murdered a father, I think, in a previous life, which is a heinous crime that sends you to hell. It's a heinous act that can really send you to the lower realms. And in this life, even though he was fully enlightened, still, and he had all the psychic powers, he used to go through keyholes and, you know... Take it as you will, it might be a nice story. But he couldn't um, actually evade being murdered in the end. He was murdered. But still, as an arahat, it hardly mattered because he wouldn't have had any ill will and he's, you know, bound for nibbana. But he had to still experience that. But other things, I mean, you don't have to experience every single thing. Absolutely not. So, um, and also the other problem with that... um, way of thinking about hardships being directly equal with the bad karma collected is that it can lead to a perspective of blame and being not compassionate and saying, oh, somebody's, say, physically disabled in some way, they have a physical disability, that must be because they had bad karma from the past. That's not the way we're supposed to understand bad karma or karma. What we're supposed to understand is it's forward movement, so... If I generate unwholesome deeds now, it may result in different outcomes in the future, one of which might be some kind of physical accident, or, but there might be many outcomes. So you can never, ever trace back one thing to a particular karma. This is a really bad way of thinking because it can justify all kinds of injustices. And I've even heard Buddhists, pious Buddhists, saying, well, you know, homeless people, it's because they didn't have good intentions, and I work for what I got, and and it's just not right. You know, they're sort of saying it's comically destined for those people, but our karma is what we do to help and how we relate with compassion. So for me, it's like one measure of right view is whether it leads to compassionate, uh, a compassionate response. And if your understanding of karma would sort of justify, and I'm not saying yours does, you're asking a question, a theoretical question. Um, if it would justify kind of saying, well, you know, they suffer for their own karma, like that's because they didn't do something right and it's not my problem, I don't need to help them, you know, or they're worse than me, then that isn't a view that's going to liberate <laughs> because it's, there's no compassion in that. So... Um, It's not directly equal, and nor is it actually relatable directly. Like you can't... The Buddha said it's unfathomable, actually. It's a very... um, I think the Venerable Ananda once came to him and said, oh, I understand... um, I think that was the law of dependent imagination, which is basically the arising of karma. Um, And he said, oh, I think I understand it. And the Buddha said, no, no, don't say that. It's very deep, it's very profound. So the Buddha might have had some ability to see through psychic powers into people's past lives to see what happened and why, but for us it's just not really helpful to think that way. The best thing is to think of karma as what we're doing with our mind and with our situation now. Accept the situation, it's here. You don't really know why. I mean, there might be some things you can see. Why? Like if you get a song in your head, you know it's because you listen to it. I mean, that's a simple example. But basically it's how you're relating now that is your karma. Can we ever get a new loan, refinance, or go bankrupt? What's refinance? Refinance, is it? Can we ever get a new loan, refinance, or go bankrupt with comic debt? (laughs) Hmm. You can get a new loan. That's what I mean, right? Is that the same as creating new karma now? Good karma now? Refinance, yes. Carry on. Or go bankrupt. Probably not if you're here. You've certainly not gone bankrupt yet. You're getting paid. Paychecks, I'd say. So, um, yeah, obviously we can do bad karma, uh, bad deeds that lead to bad results. Results of suffering for people that make us, you know, have to suffer for that. But I don't think even people that go down into the lower realms, they still 
get another chance. I mean, you don't want to do it. But apparently Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin who tried to kill him, he had to go down to a lower realm for that. And he is apparently going to be a future Buddha. So there you go. <laughs> so there's lots of hope. The Buddhist message is a hopeful one. It's not a fearful message. All right, we're right on time. Practicing metta. I've noticed that my main hindrance for metta, but also in life, is fear. Fear in many textures and flavors, but often so strong and coming on so quickly that it snuffs any little flame of metta I'm nurturing straight out. But you do have a little flame of metta. So there are gaps. I wonder what I can do to work on this, both in practice and everyday life. Is there a practice that might be better suited for me than before metta? And then there's a joke. I have to read that last because that will be the last thing that I say <laughs> in Q&As. Okay, so I'll read that last. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, is, there a better is there a practice that might be better suited for me before metta? It's a good question, actually, because if it is a persistent hindrance, it might be good to actually work directly with it. I mean, maybe some sort of a passana practice. But whether you do that before or after metta, I think it will work the same. I went on this one retreat where I did a lot of metta practice, and the teacher was actually teaching the Mahasi technique, which I haven't really done much of because I just carried on with metta. But they taught it metta as a prerequisite or as a samatha practice, to still the mind and overcome ill will and soften the mind before going into Vipassana. So that's samadhi leading to insight, so to speak. But also, I mean, because my goal nowadays or my orientation nowadays is more samatha inclined, I usually work first with some kind of light insight practice, at least settling the body, working with any coarser hindrances that might be arising, um, if there's any irritation, just embodying that sense so that I'm actually directly observing it, but in an embodied way. Because if you observe the trigger of the fear or the trigger of the anger, you're just going to keep rolling in the anger or the fear. So it's about learning to get closer to the actual sensation. But of course, if that's overwhelming, that's also difficult. So taking in an attitude of kindfulness, you know, the mindfulness and really the gentle, soft, friendly awareness and maybe not going right into the fear but just also experiencing the parts of the body probably the legs and the arms that don't have the fear and then almost creeping up on it or just having a generalized sense of the body and just getting a little bit close to it really gently and just sitting with that for a while might help I mean I went through some big anxiety attacks it was partly hormonal but it was actually really distressing. I mentioned in passing that we had a big um, crisis in the trust about two year, only two years ago, actually. And it wasn't good. And there was some abusive, manipulative behavior that only I was recipient of and no one else was aware of that I had to talk to my teacher about and hope that he'd believe me, which he always he did, especially when he read some of the emails. And um, I was just having anxiety attacks because this person was turning other people against both me and my teacher, actually. And we lost half the trustees because of that. And, uh, I mean, for me, that was like my project, you know, my kind of baby in a way, because it is. It's like something that has the power to help so many people that we poured all this loving care into. And I was having, like, proper anxiety attacks, trembling and shaking and... You know, much of the time I thought I was being with it, but it was almost too difficult to be. But some of the time, if I had the confidence and courage, I could just really go into it, really, really go into it and just say, OK, you are really welcome no matter what. Like, even if it feels like my world's falling in on me and the hormones as well were crashing down. And I don't know if there's any other... There must be women here who've gone through men, but it's weird. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, my goodness. It's like everything's falling away and you think, am I going kind of mad? But it's physiological because it comes on all of a sudden and it's just quite scary. It's like the ground goes away. And um, so all this was happening. And then if I could really be with it, it would actually 
sometimes lift almost in an instant. But of course, you have to not do it so that it lifts. You have to do it really by saying, I'm here for you and like, okay, I'm ready for this. So, but it depends on your state of mind. Most of the time I'd say just be very gentle, but some of the time you might feel like you can turn towards it. However, I still think it's good to carry on with the meta practice in daily life from time to time, because you are getting some meta coming up. You say that there is um, a flame. It doesn't matter if it snuffs out quickly. Remember what the Buddha said, I don't know if I said it, but he said that even a finger snap of metta is incredibly beneficial, more so than giving like 200 pots of food to monastics, good monastics or something like this. A finger snap, because it's starting to cut through those habits. And it doesn't happen all at once, but it's a break in the habit. And the mind starts to incline that way. And I'm sure when you go back into your lives, all of you are going to find moments of meta coming up or ways of relating that are softer, gentler, more forgiving, you will just find it happening when you least expect it and this is the result. So don't always measure it by how much you experience during the practice because it's about just setting the mind in that direction. So yeah, I would say some kind of getting in touch with the sensations of it but also with the kindness always, with the gentleness always and um, at times courage to go a bit deeper and also continue with the meta practice from time to time. And notice also the times that you don't feel the fear because sometimes we can notice our main hindrance, which is a good thing because we're getting to know our minds, but then we sort of extrapolate that into everything. It's like, I am a fearful person and this is how I am, you know, and then you only see those fears and you link them up. It's like, I was fearful 10 minutes ago now I'm fearful again, and it becomes one incident, and you don't see the bit in between when you're actually fine. So try and see those bits when the fear isn't there, or the fear's less strong, and bit by bit you'll realise it's just a tiger in disguise. Not a tiger, a sheep in disguise of a tiger. <laughs> it's not a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's just a, a response of the nervous system. The nervous system's in flight, fight, or whatever. But uh, there's actually nothing immediately threatening your life, most probably. <laughs> okay, now we have a joke. I think it's a joke. A cloud and a mountain walk into a bar. Ouch! exclaimed the bar. <laughs> and just then the bar was awakened. <laughs> okay, so that's how you do it. <laughs> and that is the end of the Q&A. Thank you very much for your wisdom. <laughs> but just try getting a cloud and a mountain into a bar. Very difficult. <laughs> Thank you so much for your beautiful questions and practice and, yeah, good spiritedness, warm heartedness. It's really a joy to share together. And, um, thank you for laughing at my not so funny jokes. It's really sweet, I must say, <laughs> to um, have that laughter. <laughs> so let's just sit quietly for a couple of minutes to the end of the evening and then have a really nice rest or continue to meditate in your rooms if you wish. <laughs>